Hello everyone and welcome to Edu Search Clinics. I am Dr. Gunjan Desai and today we are going to continue our discussion on biliary tract cancers or bile duct cancer and we are going to focus now on intrahepatic bile duct cancer or intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So we have already seen the anatomical classification, the definition and the subtypes in the previous video as well as the risk factors. And now we are going to focus on how this disease presents clinically some important commonly asked data questions, imaging features, and we are going to discuss in detail the imaging part of it and then the immunohistochemistry and molecular testing. In the upcoming parts of this series, we will discuss the treatment and algorithmic approach to management of this disease. So features of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma or how it presents clinically, what are the commonly asked data points on this disease that you need to remember. Understand that it represents 3% of all gastrointestinal cancers, whereas 10% of biliary tract cancers are intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. When we are asked most common primary liver cancer, it is HCC. Remember the word primary is very important because if you are asked most common liver cancer, then it is liver metastasis. If it's most common primary liver cancer, it's HCC. If it's second most common primary liver cancer, then it's intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. 15% of all primary liver cancers are intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Usually they are diagnosed late as they are asymptomatic or present with vague symptoms and resectable cases are only 12 to 40 percent. So less than half of your patients that you see will be resectable. Five year survivals, if not resectable, is very dismal at 9 percent, whereas up to 40 percent if it is resectable. Even after resection, nearly 70% will have recurrences. No risk factors are present in almost 70% of the cases. And the point is that because no risk factors are present in so many patients, it is difficult to have screening recommendations. So if you remember the previous video, we have discussed the common risk factors. I had highlighted some of the risk factors for you to remember. And based on these risk factors, the surveillance guidelines have come into play. So we saw that primary sclerosing cholangitis is a very strong risk factor. Its prevalence is 6 to 13 percent and lifetime risk of cancer development is 20 percent. So in these cases, annual MRI, MRCP and CA-199 is recommended as a surveillance measure to identify disease early. Coming to cirrhosis, as we already know for HCC also, CEA, CA-199, alpha fetoprotein and ultrasound 6 monthly is a good surveillance strategy. For hepatolithiasis, resection is not a prevention strategy. For liver flukes, again, ultrasound 6 monthly and CA-199 6 monthly is recommended. So these are some of the common risk factors for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma where surveillance is advised. Coming to diagnosis, if your patient is undergoing screening based on the risk factors, then after screening, what to do? Usually the first step is ultrasound. We will discuss reports, tumor markers. We know that CA-199, CE and alpha fetoprotein are commonly done in liver cases. If CEA and CA-199 are done together, it has 85% accuracy of providing a diagnosis. The other spectrum of patients is patients who present with symptoms. There can be abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. In later stages of the disease, the patients can present with jaundice, anorexia, weight loss and pruritus. If these features are present, usually the patient is inoperable, may have nodal disease and prognosis is poor. So the screening based patients will have better outcomes than patients who present with symptoms. As for any disease, diagnosis is based on imaging, tumor markers, biopsy when required and molecular testing now is increasingly being done in bile duct cancers and this is because we have a lot of molecular targets that can be used in treatment and better prognosis of cholangiocarcinoma. 
So after ultrasound and tumor markers, as far as we have seen, clinical presentation, identify your patients or risk factor based screening, ultrasound is done, markers are done. What is the next step? Guidelines suggest that an MRI with MRCP will give you more information than a CT scan. Practically, based on availability, cost criteria, contraindications to MRI or CT, nephrotoxicity, patient preference, all these points are considered and you can do a liver protocol, which is a triphasic scan. We have separate videos on liver protocol, CT and MRI, as well as pancreas protocol. So you can have a look at those videos in the radiology playlist. Liver protocol, CT or MRI is what is done. As we know, you will have pre-contrast images, arterial images, portal venous and delayed images. Beware that the images that you are seeing currently are diagnostic of HCC. It is not an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. This is put here so that you remember the liver protocol video that we have seen. Now coming to features of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the disease has heterogeneous enhancement. In MRI, it is T2 hyperintense at periphery, whereas center is hypointense. T1 is hypointense. Capsular retraction is seen in up to 30% cases. You can see this, that is capsular retraction. This is classical of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, okay? The liver capsule retraction is classically seen in IHCs. You can see that there is progressive peripheral enhancement. From pre-contrast to arterial phase, the enhancement increases and it progresses centripetally. Centripetally, that is from outside to inside, there is progressive and concentric filling and pulling of contrast rise up to the venous and the delayed phase. You can have biliary dilatation in the vicinity. You can see some biliary dilatation in the vicinity and there will be lobar atrophy of the ipsilateral lobe commonly. If bilateral portal veins are involved, then you may have contralateral atrophy as well. So these are the classical features of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, something that you should remember for life. The images are very representative of IHCC, pre-contrast, arterial phase, you see peripheral enhancement and centripetal and concentric feeling of contrast up to venous and delayed phase. You also look at node positive and metastasis on CT and MRI. Satellite nodules can be seen and multifocal disease can be seen. Now, this is a classic slide that I always use while discussing how to manage these patients. And if you have not seen the previous videos, we have a lot of videos on the liver in the liver playlist where you will see a detailed discussion of this slide. So extent of disease after CT and MRI liver protocol, if the disease is not upfront resectable, what is used is a PET scan. Endoscopic ultrasound can be used for lymph node biopsy. Diagnostic laparoscopy is occasionally advised. PET CT in these cases is usually recommended in all cases in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma as per literature. Detection of occult metastatic disease is seen in up to 30% of cases. So PET scan can change the plan of management in nearly one third of cases. That is a significant number. Endoscopic ultrasound, like I said, is for basically the nodal biopsy and diagnostic laparoscopy is advised in high risk cases. That is multifocal disease, questionable vascular invasion or peritoneal disease and high tumor marker. If there is no metastatic disease, PET scan is negative. You need to assess the patient performance status, which is done using the ECOG or the Karnofsky scale. And you also need to assess the liver function where we assess the functional reserve, the anatomical as well as the functional volume and presence or absence of portal hypertension. This slide we have discussed in another video in a lot of detail. So if you have not seen that video and if you want to understand these points, then please look at that video as well in the liver playlist. Now coming to extent of disease staging as we know, Decision making is based on patient fitness, organ fitness, that is the liver fitness, the tumor criteria. And this is the tumor criteria where you have T1 to T4. 
nodal disease where N1 is regional node metastasis present and M1 is metastatic disease present. Whenever you are assessing scans for liver as well as pancreas, you have to look at the vascular relations, the vascular anatomy and the variations as well as the biliary involvement. Look at the nodes and metastasis, intrahepatic as well as extrahepatic and the markers. Based on all these factors, if the patient is fit, the liver is fit, the LFT is not very deranged, based on your scan assessment, the tumor is operable, nodes are negative and there are no metastasis, marker is in control, then your patient has resectable disease. So that is how your decision making can be done. Remember all these points, it's basically the TNM with patient fitness, organ fitness and markers. So if you remember these six points, you can make your decisions very easily in cases with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. For all other patients where any of these points are not matching, the patient has an unresectable or metastatic disease. So that is how imaging-based diagnosis can be done. Tumor markers we have seen. Now we go to a bit of biopsy, IHC and molecular testing. Done in a lot of cases these days because as we have discussed, more than half of these patients are going to be unresectable or high-risk resectable disease. And in all these cases, neoadjuvant therapy has a role because now you have a lot of actionable targets in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So remember that biopsy is not mandatory, just like in pancreatic cancer we have discussed, upfront low-risk resectable cases, each world is important, low-risk and resectable cases, biopsy is not mandatory. For all other cases, biopsy is indicated. So morphological type, we have seen the small as well as the large duct types of IHCC that can be made out on biopsy. For differential diagnosis, remember that your general histopathology may just give suspicion of adenocarcinoma. However, for liver, adenocarcinoma can arise from colon, lung, breast as well as pancreas. So you need immunohistochemistry for differentials and subtyping. We already saw large duct versus small duct disease on immunohistochemistry. Colon markers, CDX2 and STAT B2 positive. Lung markers, mainly TTF1 and NAPSIN A positive. GATA3 is breast and CK7 and CK19 positive is pancreas with CK20 negative. So all these immunohistochemical markers will help you in differentiating or adenocarcinoma biopsy in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So with that, we come to an end on how to work up patients of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. In the upcoming parts of this series, we will discuss management of resectable disease as well as unresectable disease. Thank you.